Now it's time for Chewing the Fat with your host, Bevan Jones. Well, g'day and welcome to another edition of Chewing the Fat down here again today at Anytime Fitness at Glenelg where the man next to me, the great Phil Smythe, is a member and myself as well. Now, the man himself, Phil Smythe, what a star. Four Olympic <laughs> Games. <a> star! <laughs> three, three, <laughs> three, three champions as a coach in the NBL, three championships as a player in the NBL as well. He's done it all. Smythe, uh, talk to us about your career highlights and lowlights to get to begin with. Oh, lowlights. I, I was probably pretty lucky. I, I think the low light in the end was uh, when I ripped up my shoulder and tried to play half a season with a shoulder that had a torn rotator cuff and two fractures through the joint. wasn't all that successful on right hand, but we had a crack at it. That was probably the lowest point. I think the high points that far outweigh. I mean, the championships, obviously, as a player were great, and then the three with Adelaide as a coach, and the Olympics, obviously, that's the top of the tree. So, uh, you know, it's been... Uh, It'll be a good journey, been a fun journey, and uh, some great memories. And uh, of course, you started your career as a junior in Adelaide, Smythe. Yeah, talk us through that and sort of your basketball Yeah, so too. well, I actually uh, made a, a terrific start to my career, I might say, but they say my dad coached the church team. The church was around the corner, Church of England, St Dunstan's, and my brother played. He's 18 months older, so I was the team mascot. Turned up Saturday afternoon, we used to play, and uh, I used to just go along and watch, obviously, and then one day only four players turned up, so I had to play, so this is my big moment. Six years old, jump ball just down in the keyway near the basket, and a guy jumps up and taps it to me, and I grab it, turn around and shoot it, and it goes in, I'm doing all the whooping and carrying on you can possibly imagine. I need to realise I've shot it in the opposition goal, mate. So uh, oh, no. my career didn't get off to a flying start, mate. I, I was always good with the opposition, really friendly sort of guy. So uh, from there it grew, obviously, and then it accelerated. I actually had to make a choice when I got to 15 between Aussie rules footy and basketball. And I, I decided to go with basketball only because the guy that coached the footy team the following year was one of those really abusive type coaches. And uh, we used to sit in the change rooms next to them and he'd come in and he'd just abusing the players. I thought... You know, I don't want to play for that kind of guy, so I took, I'll take a year off because I actually love footy more than basketball. Went to basketball and then things just fell my way really quickly, accelerated up the ladder pretty quick and then, you know, as they say, the rest was history and it turned out to be the right choice. And talk to us about 1980, you represented Australia for the very first time with the Boomers in the Moscow Olympic Games, uh, what, what sort of experience was that like? Yeah, it was a bit of controversy obviously before we went to the Olympics because uh, Russia had invaded Afghanistan and the USA were going to uh, abandon their athletes, they weren't going, they weren't going to compete because you know, of the invasion into Afghanistan. Of course, the United States forgot to mention at that time that they were still selling wheat to the Russians, but that was okay. It was okay if you're making money, but we'll go over here on the glory road and punish the athletes. And, you know, the really bad part in all of that for the athletes that had worked so hard from the United States to get there was once the Olympics started, it actually made no difference at all. It made no difference. You know, the boycott didn't help the American athletes from going and it didn't make any stand against Russia invading Afghanistan other than a bit of publicity at the start. So there was a moment there where Australia looked like boycotting, you know, going with the Americans and then the government originally decided to boycott and then they thought there was an uproar from the Australian people so they said well, we'll put it out as a vote to the people and of course the people all voted for the athletes to go so it was fantastic and the people in Russia were great and I think sometimes they were always seen as the bad Russians and the good Americans. I don't know that it's quite that accurate. <laughs> and uh, 1982 was your first uh, year in the NBL and you played for St Kilda and then you went on to play with the Canberra Cannons where you won those three championships as a player. But you never really played for Adelaide. Um, what was that, Smarty? In the early days? So the early days, the league started in 1979. I was playing with my club, Sturt, and so I was hopeful that Sturt would get into the NBL because at that stage it was club teams, not so much the state-type setup. And uh, after three years, they hadn't got in, and I'd become good friends with Brian Curl, who coached St Kilda, because uh, I'd stayed with him at different times when I'd gone over to play with the Australian team. And so we'd ever talked about if I played in the NBL, you know, Curly had convinced me that I had to play my first year with him. And uh, out of our friendship, that's exactly what happened. I'd bought a business here. I was running my own business and commuting four times a week to go to Melbourne. You'll laugh. My salary that year was $1,500, mate. So I was paying more to park at the airport than I was actually getting paid to play. So, uh, and then the next year, I uh, had a job offer to go to the Institute of Sport in Canberra. And uh, my then wife, well, partner, Jenny Cheeseman, who's a superstar, she got offered a job at the Institute, so we decided to move for two years. It finished up being 10 years, 
and lots of success and it was a great journey. Then I actually came back to Adelaide then and played uh, two years here in Adelaide. Would have played more, but one of the coaches, a fellow called Mike Dunlap, he didn't want me in the team. He wanted younger guys. And that was his choice as a coach. He's got the right to do that. But uh, So then I, I went and played in Sydney for Bob Turner. Uh, again, a guy who had played for in camera. So it was more about friendships than money. And that finished, returned back to Adelaide. And I was about to start a role with uh, Channel 7 in the media. And then the job offer came to coach. It was either coach now or don't do it. Once you're out for a period of time, I think you're out for too long. So obviously I had 11 seasons with Adelaide coaching and it was a pretty successful time. Yeah. So the last couple of years where the club was bankrupt. So it wasn't all that much fun those last couple of years. Well, the three championships was pretty good. So but that didn't hurt. hurt. <laughs> <laughs> and now back to your playing career, 1992, at Barcelona, it would have been amazing because you played against the dream team, the likes of Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, Charles Barkley, the list goes on. But you had a bit of a stoush with Charles Barkley. Talk to us about that. <laughs> yeah, I didn't have the Shane Hill one on court. Mine was actually in the corridor. So uh, what had happened in the lead up to Barcelona Barcelona was Magic Johnson had came out and announced that he had contracted the HIV virus. And of course, remember we go back to 1992. We're not we're not in 2019. So the knowledge then about the HIV virus was that you could catch it by sitting next to someone and breathing, or if they had blood on and you got blood on you, you could catch it. Or if you're in a spa that they'd been in, you could catch it. So a lot of it was misinformation, but that was what was circulating at that time. So we'd come back from a trip overseas and uh, Pat Micken, who was then the journalist writing for the news, rang up to see how our tour went in preparation for the Olympics. At the end of the conversation, she said, oh, Magic Johnson's just announced that he's got the HIV virus. How do you uh, feel about playing against it? And I said, as long as medically it's okay, I've got no problem at all playing against Magic. Next day, the headlines were Smythe refuses to play Magic. Oh. So it kind of escalated really quickly and another player had come out and said that he wouldn't play against Magic Johnson. So for a couple of days, Basketball Australia thought it'd be best not to make any comment on it, but the problem was it went global in, in that short period of time. And so uh, I was living in Canberra at the time, I had 24 hour police around the home because I was getting death threats that I hated the gay community and I didn't like people with illness. And none of that was true at all. Finally, Brian Sander, who was the Olympic doctor, who was just a, a ripping bloke, unfortunately Brian's not with us anymore. He came out and said, well, actually it's a reasonable question. And then everyone, that's the first week it was really emotive. So now we're into the second week, everyone's gone, well, Actually, there's a pretty good question. What's the answer to that? So suddenly, and at home, I actually have in the shed two boxes, big full-size boxes from doctors all around the world saying it's okay to play and boxes where they're saying it's not okay to play. So I, there was just a lot of not good information at that time. And anyway, when I got to Barcelona, uh, we were out on the Oval, 10,000 athletes out on the Oval, and I went up to PJ Colissimo, who was an assistant coach with the American team, and said, I need to speak to Magic Johnson because I need to clear up the Magic, what I said. And so uh, he said, yeah, so I walked up, not knowing Magic Johnson, a fairly physically imposing guy, six foot nine, and he was as good as it could possibly be under the circumstances. So I said, listen, Magic, this is what I said. Had his arm around me, he said, hey, I really appreciate you being a man and coming up and talk to me about it. He said, I know how the media works, you've got no problem with me, and it's just great. And we shook hands, stood there and chatted for a while, and walked away. Next day, uh, America played Angola in the first game, and I'd gone round into the race just to catch up with PJ and say thanks for organising it all and Charles Barkley came out and there were three of us standing here with our Australian t-shirts on and Charles came up and said which one of you little mother effers was the one that said this about Magic Johnson and the two guys that were with me both go he said it like that so <laughs> Charles has got me around the throat I'm up on my tiptoes and he's got me up against the wall seriously I was having trouble breathing and Magic came out and said hey, hey Charles what are you doing he goes, this is a little, he said, no, no, no. He said, it was a media beat up, it's all good. So Charles put me down, patted me on the head and said, sorry, he said, but if we play against him, I'm gonna take you out. <laughs> so, so that was kind of my first introduction to Charles and uh, was much more friendly with Magic and the other boys. So they were great. They, they were uh, for the, the best of all time to be there. They were so respectful and so classy about the way that they interacted with everyone, the athletes, the fans. They, they gave the United States and basketball just the best possible image from a great, talented team that you could hope for. They, they couldn't speak highly of them. Couldn't and, speak more highly, sorry. Yeah. And uh, Sean Kempson, otherwise, you had a bit of a stash with in, in the World <laughs> Championships. Uh, superstar from the Seattle Supersonics back in the day. Yeah, Charles, well, Kemp came into the game and I was just standing at the top of the keyway and he walked up and he, he was 6'10", so he's bent over and he's about this far away and he was a trash talker, which I'm not. And uh, looked me straight in the eyes and said, I'm gonna mess you up, Smythe, I'm gonna mess you up bad. And there were lots of other adjectives in there. In my head, I'm going, how does that Sean Kemp knows my name? <laughs> he knows it. It's not on the back of his head. Seriously, in my head, I'm going, yeah, this is great, isn't it? And then uh, he got a little offended that I was smiling. There's a bit more to the story anyway. He called Shaquille O'Neal over. 
and Shaq comes over and she kills a massive man. He's like, oh, Kempi, what's going on, man? He goes, oh, this little MF is smart mouthing me. So Shaq goes, what did you say, man? So well, your man Kempi came over, said he's going to lift me off the ground and snap my arms off like little chicken wings. And then he asked me what I thought about that. And I said, Shaq, I said, I think he can, because to be honest with you, I think he could. Uh, seriously, because you're a powerful unit. So Shaquille starts laughing. He goes, oh, can you leave the little man alone? <laughs> it's pretty funny, man. That was it. So, uh, but, so that was my big run-ins, mate. And they were, they were few and far between, but there are times when you have some uh, pretty powerful run-ins. Oh, well, they're good stories to, to share. Anyway, uh, good, so. In a sports side, mate, there's lots to share. There are good stories. <laughs> I can just imagine. Um, now, fast forward to your career after basketball, Smythe. You've done a bit of coaching. Um, what are you up to now these days, though? Bit more of a mentoring role now you know it's great as you get older people think you've got wisdom but whatever happens don't let them find out the truth mate because then you can't get work so i've started to do some work mentoring coaches and players and uh, i'm just about to embark up to brisbane and, and spend some time each month with uh, brisbane with the coaches up there with chris fagan and his coaches and uh, really excited about that opportunity so uh, it's just been a good journey of working and helping and uh, doing those kind of things. So just behind the scenes, man. I'm behind the scenes, low profile guy. Oh, that's, the, that's the way to do it. <laughs> and Adelaide 36 is disappointing season. Of course, they've now lost Nathan Sobey as well. They've lost Mitch Keith in the last couple of years. So two really good players to lose. Um, how do you see them going in season 2019, Smythe? Well, it's pretty early. I, I, I think Joey gets a chance to recruit you know, uh, the players that he wants. And of course, that's difficult because you've got other teams with a bigger budget. So once you've got the bigger budget, you don't always, can't always get the players you want. So I think they'll bounce back. It might take them a little bit of while, a little bit of time. So um, Joey's been in the States. His daughter's been over there and she's just got a scholarship, which was great for him and his daughter. And I think we have to have a bit of confidence that Joey's record says that he's going to be pretty good. So I'd be patient and wait and see. And I think things will be okay. Big move to the entertainment centre, which is fantastic for the Sixers. I mean, you know, it's easier to get there, more transport. It's a little bit like the Adelaide Oval story. It's a bit further out, but there's lots of restaurants and clubs and pubs, and that wasn't around the Titanium Arena. So I think it has a bit more of an atmosphere. And of course, that all gets based on winning. If you win, everybody comes and watches. If you lose, you don't draw a crowd. It doesn't matter what sport it is. Yeah, we could see 10,000 people in the end set, that's for sure. That would be great. Yeah. Um, now, Smythe, uh, round four kicks off to the, uh, the AFL this week with the power and the Crows having a couple of big games. We've got the power <laughs> taking on Richmond Saturday twilight at the Adelaide Oval. How did you see this one going? Richmond are a world, world of hurt. I think Damien Hardwick's run over about 15 black cats at the moment. <laughs> and, I, and I suspect that Dusty's not going to be playing, so that, that would be an advantage. I reckon while we touch on that, though, I reckon Damien made a really good point in his press conference that the umpires have to be aware that Dusty gets belted every time he plays. And we know that's part of the game, but there's a point where you go, really? You know, surely as a spectator, I want to go and see Dusty play. But I don't want to go and see him scragged and belted and held to the ground. So what they're doing is they're rewarding the players with less skill than rewarding the players that have got the skills. I think you've got to work out what the fans want to see what's right by the rule book. I, I hate at the centre bounce where you go out there and the blokes are all strutting around like they're roosters in the chook end, you know, belting each other and hitting each other. I'm going, really? Is, is that what we've come to see? And mate, I'll, I'll go and watch World Federation Wrestling. <laughs> Just stop it. You don't need it. There's nothing to prove by me belting you like that before a game. It proves nothing other than I'm here. Well, mate, you can walk up and say I'm here. You know, so I think when Dusty retaliated the way he did and knowing Dusty, I think it's been a build-up over a probably... 18 month period where he's finally sick of being belted behind the play and niggled and he struck out and I, I'm sure he regrets it and I, and I just think that those type of players should have some protection. I, I, you know you hear the fans go oh they're protected species, they're actually not, they're targeted species. Makes sense. Most people, most teams are targeting those kind of players so they want to distract them and get them off their game instead of, and I, and I get that from the coaching standpoint. But I, I, I'm big on protecting those type of players, saying that they're our players that people want to see. It's a bit like Michael Jordan playing. You know, like there was a period there with Detroit. Every time Jordan went to the basket, Detroit knocked him to the ground. Yes, I remember and that. And you go, yeah. well, so in the end, the crowd starts going, well, I'm not going to watch this. I want to see Jordan fly through the air and dunk. So in the end, the, they, the owners all get together and say, well, if that's the way they're going to treat Jordan, then you knock him down, then send that player out of the game. So then you, know, you will foul him, but we're not knocking him to the ground. And I think there's a balance, and I think it's too far for the guys that are less talented than the guys that have got the talent. That certainly makes a lot of sense. But in saying yeah, all that, sorry, yeah. I drank out your answer for you, mate. No, no, that's a bloom on that night. No. Uh, power. Power, power. Power will get him. Power will get him. Yep. And the Crows taking on the Roos. Uh, Roos yet to win a game this year, and the Crows are looking to bounce back. I think the Crows will be okay. You know, they've lost some players too. Injuries can really impact on a season for you, but 
in say that North Melbourne, they're a really dangerous team. They have that shin boner mentality, you know, when their backs are against the wall, that's when they fire up. But they probably need to fire in a couple of games. They haven't been able to sustain it. I think they'll be good till half time. But I think the Crows just run over the top of them. Yeah, I think you're right there. So now, Smarty, before I let you go, we're going to do a new thing called uh, Manic Mini. Ma Manic Minutes, I should say. A manic Minute. <laughs> that was through a mouth, wasn't it? A Manic and Minute, right, eh? I'm just going to go through and I'm just going to put my timer on here. I'm going to ask you. Well, I'll explode question. if it goes over a minute. <laughs> <laughs> that the chair explodes. <laughs> okay, so your favourite food? Oh, steak. Roast. Mum's roast. Mum's roast? Okay. Um, winter or summer? Summer. Summer? Why? Beaches, swimming, surf, I like body surfing. So, yeah, yeah I enjoy that. Favourite destination? The whole way? Uh, I, look, I've been to Bali a lot, but I, I reckon Europe would be my favourite destination in Europe. Yep. Uh, favourite drink? Yeah, that is a good question. Uh, Coca Cola, Pepsi Max. Water. <laughs> I don't really have a favourite drink, mate. So I don't drink no alcohol, so I couldn't bless you. It's smart, man. That's what I mean, it would be a Coopers. If it was a beer, I would have said Coopers because I, I, like, uh, I like Glenn Cooper and the boys down there, but no, yeah. no beer. Okay. Yeah. Toughest opponent? Oh, Saronis, Marshallinas, Stras and Petrovic. Uh, one was um, played with Croatia, the other one with Lithuania. They were, and they both played in the NBA, superstar players. Uh, favourite movie of all time? Oh, jeez, there's a few of those. Look, I reckon Shawshank Redemption was it was one that I that I that I really liked, and I like Gladiator. I, I, I like when the Aussies are in and they like Russell Crowe, and it's a great movie. So probably Gladiator. Well said, Phil Smart. It's been absolutely chewing, chewing the fat. Yes, yeah. you can get on it more for Bevo. <laughs>